20, what, what, Ethan, you're motioning. Go ahead and unmute. He can't you can't unmute. unmute, that's why. Okay, ask to unmute. How's that work? Okay, awesome. Trip. All right, well, oh, uh, let me just go ahead. I needed to make you co-host. Uh, the reason it, it reverted back. Co-host, I think we're all set now. Terrific, well, onward. Um, do I hear a motion to um, open this meeting? So moved. Go ahead, second. Seconded. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Aye, terrific, thank you. Annie, do you want to take us through any adjustments to the agenda? Gladly. So we will be talking about surveys from Panorama, specifically an equity and inclusion survey, a family and school relationship survey. And uh, that's item 4B. And we will also uh, be congratulating Mr. Driver's class on quite an honor that they got. Um, and we, uh, I had to add an approval of policy subcommittee minutes, which will just be Ethan and Christine because I neglected to do that at our last meeting. So they will be voting on those and we will not be having executive session this evening. Very good. Thank you very much. All right, we're moving into public comment. Um, as a reminder, keep your comments to no more than three minutes and um, ideally pertaining to the topic of the evening. And if you are interested in making a comment, go ahead and raise your digital hand and we will unmute you. All right, seeing none, let's move forward with presentation and discussion items. Item A, the fiscal year 24 budget update and town meeting warrant, Annie. Perfect, I am going to share my screen. We do not have anything for the town meeting warrant in terms of capital items. What we will have are is the school department budget. Our capital items were approved at special town meeting in the fall. So we don't have any additional items that we're asking for in spring town meeting again, besides the budget. Nothing has changed in terms of the request that I presented to you at our meeting in December. We're still looking at a 1.66 increase from fiscal year 22 to total expenditures and requesting a 2% increase from the town to local contribution. What I've added to this document is some information about revenue and expense trends. I have page nine up right now, just to give you a sense of, so the way in which we get revenue through local contribution from the town, through school choice revenue, um, and our expenses include choice out, charter out, and career and tech education uh, outplacements like Smith Vocational. Good news on the choice front, you see that our choice numbers remain very strong. That's really saying something, particularly um, they remained high during COVID and post COVID. This is particularly important because you'll see there are some data also in this document that uh, demonstrate that resident, what's called resident member enrollment. So people who live in Hadley for whom the town is fiscally responsible, our resident member enrollment is declining overall. Um, the number of school age children, resident children are declining. And so we do anticipate uh, the New England School Development Council in their projections anticipates that we'll see an increase in resident enrollment in around 2028, 2029. It, they anticipate it will rebound, but it's particularly important that our school choice numbers stay strong. And I'm pleased to report that they are staying quite strong. That also allows us to, for example, this year in our operating budget, we have over $800,000 that we look to apply to the budget and has made it possible for us to return funds to the town. We talked about that last time. So this is good news. Um, virtual school tuitions, that's a part of school choice. There are two virtual schools. The number of students we have enrolled in virtual schools has increased, has decreased rather, excuse me. Um, so we're seeing that come down. We're grateful for that as well, uh, that we can uh, meet the needs of our students in the district. There are There is detailed information about choice, what district students come from um, when they choice in. That's a 
green column and where they go when they choice out. So these are data that go back to, I've kept these data since about, since I started in fiscal year 14, that you see here the last six years, I guess we had there. Um, and what I am most, I'm gonna scroll through the choice information. And again, this is linked into the agenda. So anyone in the public can view this information. Um, for the most part, in most districts, we receive more students than we have going out. Um, there are a few districts in which that is not the case. Um, but frequently in some districts, we are seeing that our choice out numbers are going down, even if at this point uh, we saw more going out than coming from a particular district. Uh, and in addition to school choice, there are data also about how school choice contributes to diversifying our school, the students in our schools. And that's really important. The census data, which will be included in the draft of the equity dashboard that I'll have for you next month. The census data in Hadley demonstrate that the schools are more diverse than the town itself. So school choice clearly is an effective way for us to diversify our student body. And what I'm really happy about and um, proud of is that uh, I've always said, you've heard me say this for years, that I would love Hadley to be the destination district for families of students who have, student, who have children with disabilities. So you see in our choice out students with IEPs that it's two to one. For, so for every one student who has an IEP who's choiced out of the district, two have come in from other districts. And that just makes my heart sing for lack of a better way of describing it. Our charter school enrollment has remained pretty constant. Unfortunately, tuitions in charter schools have increased. So while we're seeing, we anticipate a reduction of two full-time equivalents, essentially two uh, headcounts for charter next year, the tuition itself will increase overall. And I'm gonna skip down to, again, people can look at these. I'm gonna skip down to chapter 74. Those are career and technical education students. So you see from a high of 35 in FY19, we're projecting 16 students in FY23. I am hoping, and we're not finished with this work yet. I, uh, Himara, you and I have spoken about uh, my desire to kind of marry early college high school and technical education. I did have a conversation with two people from the state about that. Um, are there ways to have uh, early college pathways that are really focused on technical education so that students could uh, learn trades? And also like students in the early college pathway uh, get early college credits. So I, I am in conversation with the state about what that might look like. Um, and I'll be wrapping this up for you folks. This is what I'm most thrilled about. So as I said, there is one path in choice if you don't live here. And there are three paths out, career tech ed or vocational schools, charter schools and choice. So it is really hard for the total in to exceed out. First time this fiscal year, we got mighty close last year. It's first time this year. I'm thrilled about that. That's, that's a big deal. And I hope that we can keep it up. I do believe that some of the programs that we've invested in, STEAM at the elementary school, introducing Spanish as an option at the elementary school, even in these these small, as uh, Humera, you would say, these pilots and these experiments to see what people enjoy, what parents and students like. Um, our innovation pathways, our early college high school, I was blessed to have 10 students help us with our interviews of the safe schools and DEI specialist. And when one of the candidates asked the students, what do you, what's one thing you really like about Hopkins? Three students with very different academic and behavioral profiles said, early college, high school. Um, so having that option. So I, I do believe that some of these pathways programs are helping us and I'm, and I'm very grateful for that and we'll keep doing it. Um, the town is extremely generous. I always point that out. So the town gives more than the minimum required by the state. Joyce, I know you'll be with us during announcements. We don't take that lightly. I want you to know and I want the town to know 
we um, are honored by that generosity and work very hard to be good stewards with those investments. And I hope that that choice and exceeding choice out overall is a demonstration of that. And to put it in perspective though, um, still Hadley uh, spends as a percentage of total operating in the most recent data you can get on this from the Department of um, Local Services or Department of Revenue from DOR or DLS is fiscal year 21 because all the expenses and revenues have to be closed out in the town. Um, and so you can see that the percentage of the school department budget as a percentage of total operating expenses in the town is about 39% of the budget. And you can see where that puts Hadley compared to some of its neighbors. Um, so that it's the town is um, is supportive of the schools and is extremely generous to the schools and we're very grateful. And at the same time is able to fund many other departments um, and in a way that uh, the schools are not um, taking up all the resources in the room. You can see that comparison. And finally, um, and yet our per pupil expenditure of per pupil investment is one of the highest in the region. Um, so you can see that um, Hadley is investing in its students. So that was the information that was added to the document. This document is linked in the agenda and anyone can have access to that. I'm happy to take any questions or it was just an FYI. There's no vote necessary. You'll keep getting updates. And in March, we'll have our official public hearing. The notice will go in the paper. Um, I'll do that in March in case something happens. And so we still have April to get it done before. We must, the school committee must approve a budget before um, it can go to town meeting floor. So this is, Christine, the most important thing is that I don't forget to put it in the paper and that we get it voted on. <laughs> That's the most important thing that happens all year before the, the first Thursday in May. Well, thanks, Annie. Uh, let me be the first to um, to to thank you for pulling together such comprehensive data on our um, on our uh, finances and our enrollment, um, and to congratulate you and the rest of the team on um, some of the numbers we're seeing around choice in um, finally surpassing all pathways of choosing out. That is really good news. That's something that we, I, I arrived to a very different picture uh, some 10 or 12 years ago. And, uh, and it's really nice to see that having turned around. I want to um, also thank you for looking into the <clears throat> possibility of leveraging early college for technical education. I know a lot of parents who really want their kids to come out with some kind of vocational certification and, and just feel a strong loyalty to, to Hopkins and Hadley schools. And we ought to be able to find a way to get that done. So I'm really, really glad that you're looking into that. Um, those trades are increasing. They're they're just going to continue to increase in in uh, in uh, having demand for well paying jobs, and it's our obligation to try to find a way to make that happen. So thank you. Um, I want to note um, about the population decline that we are seeing in Hadley. Um, it should always be um, dovetailed with the fact that this is a broader trend that all other towns are experiencing, all other states. In fact, it's, as a nation, we're wrestling with this population decline. And so uh, it is not um, specific to anything that Hadley is doing. Um, and, uh, and it's interesting that you noted that officials predict that increasing around uh, 2028, 2029. Any data you have on that, Annie, about why, what forces are increasing, uh, are, are, are um, pointing to that would be very welcome. I appreciate that. I welcome my colleagues to time, chime in and um, offer any uh, comments or questions. No questions, just a comment. And thank you, Annie. I know that putting this together is a huge task. So thanks to you and Chris, honestly, throughout the year um, for keeping us so up to date on what's going on. 
Um, with the budget, it makes it really easy come this time of year to be able to really get a grasp on it. And then your report is fantastic. It's fantastic for us um, to, to quickly review things and understand it and make sense of it and allow us to um, figure things out without needing to ask a lot of questions. But it's also really helpful that it's available to the town as well so that they're able to review it before town meeting and really see um, the work that's being done by the school. I just think it's really helpful that 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 report is available to everybody. Um, hopefully it makes it clearer to going in where we stand in Hadley again, compared to other districts and just, you know, kind of where that, where the, where the town's money is going, where the townspeople's money is going. Thanks, Tara. Well, Mary, you asked the question I asked, which was data around the, the uh, trend, trending upward, student enrollment in the, the late 2020s, I guess. I'd love to know more about that. Yeah, um, I wonder if it is decade. <laughs> That's who publishes it. I will bring that um, when we get our update in February. So yeah. I'm wondering. And, and oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I'm wondering if stimulus checks had something to do with provide and, and the child benefit at that time. It had something to do with providing some financial stability that made people make the, I, who knows? love to dig into that. Ethan, please continue. Yeah. And I was just going to say, I mean, I, I, I agree with what everyone said, and, and this is awesome. I'd just also love to say that as a, as a, as a dad with two young kids in the system, it's nice to see the, the diversity in the schools um, that we're seeing right now, and hopefully that can continue. Thank you. Christine, any comments? Yeah, um, I'm very interested in the vocational aspect. I think yeah, that yeah, totally. um, Having, you know, um, one of my children go to vocational college um, and come out, you know, I mean, they, he went to SUNY Cobalt Scale out in New York and came out with a fantastic job and a fantastic education. Um, and so I think that if we can somehow make those connections, that would be fantastic. I, I would love that. I think it'll be a huge benefit to our kids. Them. Yeah, and I just want to note that uh, it's not like the olden days where you'd only go to the college track or the vocational track. Now these vocational track are built upon with college degrees and really are strong fundamentals in making, a kind of making that we used to have in our generation with shop, woodworking, and uh, and, and uh, printing, uh, with printing presses, but that does not exist to the extent that, that we, we should these days. Right. So I, it's, it would be great to bring that back. Right, it's a technical college, but it's a four year business degree. So um, it's just that it, it's geared towards uh, the you know, vocational industry and a more hands-on approach to um, a traditional liberal arts college. And I, I, it's great. And my comments aren't directed uh, just on, on what your son is doing. Look at uh, Tesla vehicles, for instance. Oh, right, and any of that. Mm -hmm. Electronics and engineering that is required. It goes well beyond what vocational trades would have, mm -hmm. of yesteryear, would have required. And so, uh, yes. So you're hearing an enthusiastic support for this uh, line of query, Annie. And I would say, um, let's let's find a way to pilot something, regardless of whether we have state support or not. Uh, I'm curious about what that could look like, um, and um, you know, the only way we'll be able to, in some instances, show the state that there's a case for this is by being out front as we are on many things. And so, I, I'd love to think about what that would look like. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, moving on to the next item of the agenda, district plans for administering equity and inclusion survey and family and school relationships survey uh, and sharing information. Annie. Yes, so I wanted to let the school committee know that um, I plan to engage the services of Panorama. Um, and Panorama is a company that, sorry about that, Panorama is a company that um, helps a number of districts in this area, um, works with 
Chicopee works with Linux. I can pull up a list of them. Panorama uh, offers, serv offers districts services to help them administer surveys, design surveys. You can see what I included in the agenda are examples of two surveys that I'd be interested in doing this year. One is on equity and inclusion. That survey is for staff and for students and another on family and school relationships. I know that this has been a priority for the school committee. I know the school committee also when I arrived was constructing its own survey and doing that administration and data collection I did encourage um, school committee members, and certainly the public can see this, although I will not be showing it tonight during the meeting, but the hyperlink that says information is a brief four minute video that really shows the infographics that Panorama provides um, when giving support for surveys. Uh, this is information. I do have some information that will be included in the equity dashboard, but it's it's dated, it's from 2021. It's good information, it's important information. Every voice is important. It also is limited insofar as um, low response rates or small groups and doesn't have a lot of elementary voice. Panorama surveys, um, they're empirically valid for grades six through 12, and um, but they're, you can be used from grades three through 12. So um, it's not that, you can't garner information in grades three and five. I mean, certainly anybody who works in higher ed just understands that um, the, the conclusions that one might draw, they're saying, you know, kind of six through 12 is where we've tested the validity of the empirical validity of the instrument. It doesn't mean you won't get information in the lower grades. So that's what I'm uh, looking to do so that I can inform the school committee. Again, I know this has been a priority. It's really getting a sense of how are families feeling about their relationships with the schools and the experience that their, their children are having and um, how are students and staff feeling in terms of equity and inclusion. Um, so I just wanted to make folks aware of that. And um, if there were in looking at any of the questions or the topic areas. The equity and inclusion survey, all of those topic areas, uh, we could administer that as the entire survey. Family and school relationship survey, um, it's recommended that no more than four to six topic areas. You can see that that includes more than four to six topic areas. Um, but what I would be doing is um, identifying those topics that align with Things that the school committee has identified as important uh, over the year and that align with our rubric or evaluation rubric. So it was just an update for folks. Thanks for the update, Annie. Uh, Christine. So one of my concerns, or I should have said well, more like pet peeves is, you know, whenever we've um, put out results, we always do it in percentage. Well, when you have such a small district, those percentages are kind of skewed. I mean, you know, from experience, it would, you know, say that 10% of the kids didn't pass the eighth grade MCAS. Well, you only have 40 students. So that's four kids. <laughs> so it, it, it kind of, you know, when you say, you know, so when we get the results, is that going to be something that is taken right, into right. account? Because each class is different for diversity, the percentages is different. It's yeah, that's, an, that's an excellent question, Christine. And one of the reasons that I really, here's the bottom line, I need help. Now you're new to the school committee. The other members can tell you, just leave it to Mackenzie to do a survey and buckle up for the ride. Like it's, it's really hard to, to one, construct, to administer. And then even, this is a science, right? So to make a determination about, um, for example, DESI has cutoffs of, how large of an end before you actually put that percentage in a survey or report on it. What you will be able to see, what I like about the graphics is that you can see changes over time. All of your surveys are there. You can see what's changed in responses from year to year. You could even then track cohort. Um, the surveys can be either anonymous or confidential. I'd be inclined to do a confidential survey. So what does that mean? That means an individual student gets an individual link and that way they're not completing their own um, data. There's less room for error in terms of 
Um, if we want to understand if students with a particular profile are having a positive experience or a negative experience. Um, but it's confidential. We're not reporting out it, see who they are, but but the roster ties to, um, to their data. Um, but also I believe that you see similar to when I look at um, information infographics from uh, the Department of Ed, that you would see not only the percentage, but you would see the, the number for each response as well. So part of the reason that I'd like support is so that I'm not constantly trying to look up, should I, and, and I'm gonna apologize in advance, I've invested a lot of time in pulling together data, analyzing data for the equity dashboard, but sometimes I'm still left struggling with, should I even be reporting on this end? I mean, you'll see these teeny tiny numbers. Should I even be reporting a percentage here? Um, I think there's still good information for us to see because we see, we're just asking ourselves in terms of the dashboard and our starting point, where do we see over and under representation in terms of access and outcomes? Um, where do we see disparate outcomes? And what might that mean? So we're just starting a conversation. So we're gonna invest in really trying to understand the experiences of students and staff and families. I just need a partner who does this, like this is what they've been trained to do. It kind of like Gallup. Thank you, Annie. And let it, you know, I don't know how we can get more involvement. Obviously with teachers and students, we have a captive audience, so it's a little easier. But, you know, we, I think we really need to find a way to reach out to the parents to return the surveys. Um, I, I, I'm not quite sure, you know, we can brainstorm about how to do that or if anybody has any ideas, but uh, it just with, every, you know, with, like everything else, you tend to have the core group that they respond to everything. And it's not always the, the group that, ha that, that needs to be heard that gets heard. So, yeah. It's a really good point. And we've experimented, Annie, uh, your team has experimented with flyers, with uh, different languages, sending it out in different languages in, uh, you know, so email and print. And uh, we, we should, when we're ready, we should uh, engage just another quick brainstorm. Um, I, I'm a big fan these days of QR codes, sending a printed QR code, maybe that's custom for that individual so they can just grab it on their smartphone because they may not have a, a laptop, but they can get it on their smartphone. And uh, so um, maybe there are some clever things we can do, perhaps even an incentive. I don't, you know, if we keep it under 50, maybe a gift card or two, who knows? Maybe we can take that as a donation if the school can't engage that and, and provide it that way. But really good points, Christine. Thank you. And definitely the challenges of a small district. We have some unique challenges of being a small district. Um, I always say, uh, I can't remember which educator, uh, engineering educator taught me this. Uh, you you can't change what you can't measure. And so, you know, to, to be, to you got to know where you are in order to, you know, uh, be able to improve. And uh, I thank you, Annie, for leading us down this path. I can tell you, of course, we can do our own surveys. We have many, many years, and it's not the best techniques. We're not the best survey givers. It's, I'm really glad you're looking at uh, this uh, quality of work um, and tools that help you in a more consistent way. So thank you. And I do have at my fingertips the list of um, districts that they currently are working with in this area, Chicopee, Holyoke, Ludlow, East Longmeadow, Athol Royalis, Royalston, Quabbin, Hoosick Valley, Central Berkshire, Pittsfield, Berkshire Hills. Oh, that's embarrassing that I don't know how to say that. What is L-E-I-C-E-S-T-E-R? Leicester? Leicester? Leicester. Leicester, okay, thank <laughs> you. That was embarrassing. I, don't know, let me I hope that superintendent's not watching. What she said, Worcester and Milbury. So they all use this, use panorama data. That's pretty great. And you awesome. didn't say Worcester, so that's great. <laughs> that one I got. I used to say that Everyone one. Everyone gets that one. Yeah. Um, I have a comment. Um, so, um, Annie, when I looked through all this, um, my first reaction was, oh my God, this is fantastic. She's going to get all this data at her fingertips and she doesn't have to spend the time doing it. Um, so that was genuine, that was my first reaction. Like, this is a fantastic 
tool that frees you up, um, not that it's a mundane task, and we know how much you love data, but now it's at your fingertips and you can look at it and compare it and analyze it instead of having to be the one crunching the numbers. So I I think it's um, fantastic. I like the different views that you can have available so you can really hone in on things. I, I, I think it really... I appreciate you looking into something like this and recognizing um, that I, I think that our surveys, our surveys have been really great compared to when you think about other districts and, you know, our ability to get them out and get responses. Even if it's a small district, we still are able to get good responses from people, um, but it's just so time consuming. So I think this is fantastic. Um, I love the the, the topics um, in particular. One, it gets to the to the school committee core values and the district's core values. Um, and it also gets to that piece. And, you know, Christine, you kind of asked, you know, about how do we get people to fill these, fill these out, right? How do we get, and that's one of the things that comes up in Annie's annual review every year, right? That's that one area that we're like, you can always improve on communication. We can always do better. And that's like the area like that is so hard to say exemplary in, right? Because there's just so much you can always do. Um, so I think this is a good start, honestly. I like the idea of being able to do it every single year and tracking responses every single year because that really does give us something concrete to look at and say, here is our data. This is not subjective information. Um, so brainstorming on how we can get the engagement is fantastic. Um, Humera, you just said like gift card or something. Maybe it's something simple, like if we can get donations for a gift, we throw people's name in a raffle who participated in the survey. And every time we do a survey, we pull a name from the raffle. I don't know how you could do that with anonymity or how it, I, I don't know, but just, it's a thought. Um, and then um, the only other thought, I, I agree with, you know, the equity and inclusion surveys, um, two things on that. Sorry, I had a lot. You guys brought up a lot of good points. Um, I I like the confidentiality of it so that we can address individual needs as needed. And for the most part, I really don't think that would discourage students or staff to be able to speak freely. And I, I, I hope that we're fostering. I, I feel like Hadley is, you know, continuously working, but fostering an environment where People feel comfortable enough to speak up and share their concerns and that they'll be heard and validated and spoken to in a respectful and respected manner. Um, so I, I really like that. Um, I hear you on the grades 6 through 12. Um, I like the idea of starting it a little bit younger and getting kids exposed to this. And I feel like even though they're third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, um, you know, they are young. Um, but I feel like our third, fourth, and fifth graders have grown up in the past three years and have been exposed to a lot of different things. And I, I know my fourth grader, um, they listen, they watch, they observe. Um, and I think that they're capable of answering a lot of questions. And I think it's important to start them thinking in this kind of critical thinking manner at an earlier age so that maybe we will get more valid results when they're in sixth grade. They're exposed to it. They're used to it. They're comfortable with it. It's not something that they're going to get repercussions on, right? It becomes part of their norm and we're creating that environment. Hey, we care about you. We want to hear more. And we're getting that started at an earlier age before the high school level so that they understand this is what Hadley does. We care. We want to make it better. And this is how we do that. So I like the idea, even if it's something that we can't use when we're compiling our data, maybe it's something we can kind of just get kids used to and track and maybe even just the feedback would help us on a grade to grade level to see where kids maybe feel like maybe third grade's great, but maybe fifth grade's where it starts to get really tough for kids. I don't know, maybe if, maybe we can do something with it. Um, and then the last thing is when it comes to parent surveys, um, you know, I think, um, as easy as it can be is beneficial, right? As, as quick and easy as possible, as straightforward and non-complicated the questions are, the better results you get. 
Um, and then one thing we've always done in our in our surveys and, and worried about with feedback, like giving open feedback, is that anonymity point. I think we were always worried that people are less apt to speak freely if they had their name on it. And it's so silly because I feel like the students, I feel like I feel like the younger kids are working on being able to speak their voice and have their voices heard and have respect. And I think that it can still, even for me, myself, it can be hard to put your name out there if you've got critical feedback and worry of repercussion just from how you were brought up and the time you were brought up. And so I just, that's the only thing I worry about when it comes to the, to the parent portion is how do we get honest feedback if, you know, if, they may be a little nervous to respond because they don't know how this data is going to come out, who might be seeing it, if they're going to be, you know, treated differently. I, I don't know. So I, I like everything about it, just the, the, the parent portion. I don't know if there's any way to put some sort of, or a way to submit anonymous responses separately. Maybe it's a separate link that allows them to separate from this survey. I, I don't know. That was my only thought. Yeah. So there is this distinction between confidentiality and anonymity. Interesting, Humera, the, the person with whom I spoke said, well, so, so confidentiality, and I really want to be clear, it's not me having the name of who filled this out. It's essentially, here's a roster file. I have a unique access code. And so some information about who I am, what grade I'm in, where I go to school, um, other information is connected to that code, not my name, but I, I get, so that way we can disaggregate on, so what are the experiences of students who have disabilities in the district? To what extent do they feel like they're being academically challenged and included, for example? So that's an example, confidential, I have a QR code. Now, Panorama did say, what we found, and I can also ask those other districts, like how did you drive up your response rates? What worked? How did you get people to fill this out? They suggested an anonymous link, which essentially is, there is no unique QR code. There's just a link that goes to families. And then that's entirely, but if there's, if there's no, we would have to ask the family to provide any demographic information that we wanted. Right. So, for example, I'm going to use that same example. I'm very interested in how students with disabilities experience their education in happy public schools. Do they feel included? Um, that's really important to me. Also, do they feel challenged? Do they feel are they asked the same questions that students without disabilities are asked about post-secondary plans? So I want to know this. I also want to know how the families, what their experience is. Do they feel included? They feel like their children are being challenged. So I would imagine the anonymous, We, if it's anonymous, you just have to make sure that you ask in the survey for the demographic information that you want, right? So if you want to know if, if families of students with disabilities are having a very different experience, I'm just using that as an example. It could be any um, cohort that you're looking at. You just have to ask the parents uh, to, they have to provide that information in the survey as opposed to if it's confidential, I've got my own link and that's attached to kind of like, I, it's attached to, already attached to uh, data. Annie, I trust that you will uh, talk with your colleagues at other schools to figure out what the best way is that they've found over the years to implement this. I think we can learn a lot from people who behind the scenes, they can tell us, yeah, that's what we thought, but then we did this and that's what we learned. That's, that, that, that's that's worth that's worth gold, Christine. I was just curious. Yeah, I was just curious. So, um, when we said six through or seven through twelve, six through twelve, was that just for the student feedback or parents as well? Or or for parents, are we doing K through? Yeah, you know what? I would imagine that with parents, that it's everybody. I will verify that. But with parents, and and it was it was six through twelve. Then the studies they've done on validity, they feel very good about. So you can go looking at the empirical data, and as an instrument, this is a valid instrument. And again, it's not that you're not going to get great information. I completely talked Tara right out of the room, just like okay, I've had enough. <laughs> 
Um, so I'm kidding, Tara. I know something probably just went off with your Wi-Fi. Uh, but at three through five, that we're going to get good information from those children. It's just it, the, one can't say that the instrument is, they can't say validity to the same degree. Um, and so I would imagine, but I will verify, because we want to hear from everybody in terms of parent feedback. Um, I think younger, it has to do with being able to read. It has to do, oh, so sure. ask any any parent. Um, you just but, wouldn't be able to ask the young children. Right. I guess then I would, I, I think the only thing I would say is that um, if you're doing six through 12, you're going to get a much different experience from the sixth grader because they're at a different school than you might from the seventh grader who's low man on a totem pole on a seven through 12. Do you see what I'm saying? Like uh, the elementary school in terms of the feedback and when it talks about the teachers and you can't, you know, it's a different building. So the, the experience might be different for the kids. Will that be yeah, able to separate that? You would be able to separate that. If okay. you, you know, I watched that video a couple of times because I was mm -hmm. just, wow, that's great. You know, you can, you can look at, you can look at this from all kinds of angles. So you can separate by school, by different cohorts, by, so you can see what kinds of experiences um, students are having in different places. Yeah. Great. Well, I'm really, really excited about this and I can't wait to see our first, uh, the results of our first uh, survey through this. Annie, thank you for, uh, for finding this for us. Okay, we're moving on to the energy audit update. And Chris, are you with us? I am here, yes. Terrific. Tell us about the update. And uh, and I think, Annie, you have a grant update. So I'm, I'm thinking that you're both going to tag team this one. Sure. Um, so the, the project that we were looking at, uh, the deep energy retrofit, uh, it's kind of a four-phase project. Um, the first phase, that's the easiest one because that's just actually showing interest in, in doing it and reaching out to them. So yeah, check that one off. That was easy. Um, the next step was we had to get a facility and, um, assessment done. That was done this morning. Um, there was a person in Hopkins for a little under an hour. Um, he checked the boilers. He checked the univents, windows, uh, lighting, um, just throughout the building. Um, I spoke with him after he finished, and he said that there were a lot of opportunities in the building to uh, to make improvements. So that was definitely good to hear. Um, I was also told when I reached out to Eversource this afternoon um, that we were the first organization to actually begin this process. So, um, you know, as he said, that's good that you are getting a jump on everyone else for this. So uh, that was nice to hear. Um, Relative, so the next to step, um, oh, sorry, sorry, Chris, relative to municipalities in uh, other municipal districts in Hadley or relative to all schools across Massachusetts? He didn't say. He just okay. said we were the first, first organization. So I have to imagine. They say that to all the girls. What's that? They say that to all the girls. Ah, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the assessment results will be submitted to uh, Eversource. Um, and basically, they will take about three weeks to um, to go through it, um, come up with some plans, basically, of, you know, what we can do, um, what will help us the most. And um, that's called the, the scope and study. So they, they'll go through everything. Um, they'll come back to us with the results in, you know, roughly three weeks. Um, and then they will give that back to us and and we have to decide at that point, what do we want to do? Do we want to do the whole project? Do we want to do bits and pieces of it? Um, we are actually working to try to incorporate some of what they're doing with some of the work in the capital plan that we were doing in Hopkins anyway. So, you know, we're, we're kind of um, holding back on some parts of the project, uh, of the capital plan project, because we don't want to do something like ceiling tiles and then find out that they need to do something removing ceiling tiles. So we're, we're really trying to get all of these aligned. Um, and once we let uh, Eversource know what we'd like to do, 
Um, then we have to get what they called um, a deeper assessment. And so they would send somebody in, that's at a cost to us. Um, he said, it's typically a 50-50 cost share with Eversource. I do believe um, when we spoke with them about a month ago, they talked on a slightly better split for us than that. Um, but he said, that's pretty much their standard anyway. Um, and once we got that done, um, Eversource would then present to us kind of a roadmap of where are we going with this um, and a timeline of how long it will take. Uh, the project has to get done within three years um, and they will, they will kind of um, feed us the incentives as portions of the project are completed, um, energy saving goals are reached uh, and we, we kind of go along like that. So um, it's, it's not a short project, but actually we would know where we're going you know, in, in just a few months. So um, I was glad that they were able to come out today and uh, and do that audit for us. It, it's nice to get started on it. That's great news, Chris. Thank you so much for uh, spearheading that and so glad that you were able to have this report out in time for the school committee uh, uh, January meeting. So thank you. I can't wait to see the results of their their study. Any other thoughts or comments from my colleagues? I can just jump in with some of the grant business yeah, be really uh, short. So I communicated, Sarah, when she spoke to us, had talked about uh, the Infrastructure Reduction Act, also uh, IRA is what it's commonly referred to. And there was a funding opportunity that came out that is due this week. But I did speak with Sarah when I, I went through that and I laid out for her where I thought we fell. Um, she did agree with me and um, said that although they've been spreading the word about this opportunity in their newsletter, um, she said, well, I won't claim to have a great sense of how many applicants the department will receive I know they're really trying to steer funds to underserved districts, and we did not come close to the threshold. They used the federal poverty criteria, so that was only 15% of our population. Given the financial characteristics of the district as you lay them out, I think it is a low probability, and as you surmise, your limited time will likely be better spent elsewhere. So this is a very, it was a huge application. So mm -hmm. I did not apply for that, and I did seek for guidance, and she agreed that the amount of work that would go into it, the likelihood given um, by Fed criteria, we are only meet a 15% threshold. They really are trying to get this money into communities which, with much higher poverty levels. I'm sure there'll be other, like Chris just spoke to, and I echo that. Thank you so much, Chris, for coordinating all of that and getting all that information to us. And, you know, there's these 50-50 cost shares. Eversource are, has already done this uh, pro bono, and I'll keep my eye out for additional grant opportunities, but the IRA grant they were also looking to make awards that ranged from, so it was for the entire country and they were going to fund 20 to 100 proposals. And just to give you some idea, um, in Massachusetts alone, there are 331 school districts. I don't know how, how many there are in the nation. They were going to fund 20 to 100 proposals with awards starting at a half of a million dollars. So we just probably were not a likely candidate, but I'll keep my eye out for other grants. Thank you, I appreciate that. Okay, any other questions for Annie or Chris? No questions, just thank you both for constantly taking the time to do this and taking our discussions and thoughts and concerns and bringing them to fruition. So it's appreciated. All right, um, thank you for, for that update. We're gonna move to item D, Workforce Development and Internship Coordinator, Annie. Yes, so I am asking, and forgive the formatting in the agenda. It doesn't look like that. In Word, it does when you upload it to Google from Word. The formatting goes a little bit wonky. This would be entirely, it's this year only. We were given additional funds from the state for our Pathways programs. And as you know, we have funding to provide students with paid internships in STEM fields. We have several students now who are in various internships. And we have um, we want to provide opportunities for internships for our Innovations Pathway students. So the state has offered additional money this year. Um, and I would like to use some of that funding to pay someone to help us 
identify and coordinate internships. I really appreciate all the work that Senora is doing in kind of her halftime teaching role, half service learning and working with students who are interested in these programs. But we need somebody who's out in uh, networking with businesses and helping us set these up. And neither Senora nor I have the time or ability to do that during the day. This would end at the end of this fiscal year. So it would be advertised as such. So there's people know that this is um, paid for hours worked and, um, and it would end uh, June 30, unless there was a continuation of grant funding. And this is grant funding, not through uh, ESSER. I know we frequently, we've set aside that money for HVAC, for improvements, for um, other supports in the school. This would come from our uh, Pathways program funding that we have. Very good. Um, I do not have any questions on this. Um, anyone else? Yeah, Christine. Yeah, so I am, I'm actually thrilled with this. I, I think that we used, when I first started, we uh, we had someone who, in fact, this this was a position, um, and it was we, it was for years we had them, and then there's something happened with the grant, and it went away. And the same person also was the one who you know would do the job fair and would. Um, it, it really was a great program in which our kids went out into the community. Um, and we're able to, you know, find out if they're interested in something. I mean, nursing may be their thing until they actually go into a nursing home and realize they, they don't like blood, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So it, it gives them that opportunity to um, see how different industries work. And I, I think that uh, if this be, if this truly is a success, then, um, yeah, I think we, you know, it might be something we want to look into in terms of finding a way to fund it other, uh, other ways, because, uh, I think that students get a lot of confidence and they gain experience. And when you're from a small school and then you're going on into, you know, into either the world or college or, you know, you, you tend to be a little shell shocked. This gets our kids out there meeting people. Um, I think it's wonderful. So well said, Christine. Thank you. Tara, I don't, any I don't have a question about this. I think this position that that sounds great. No questions. Um just a quick question. Do we still do um I'm sorry if we've brought this up and I forget. Have we done a career fair since prior to COVID or is that something we can think about doing again if that felt successful. I, I know Brian Beck did one a few years back. I'm not sure if we've done one since he's left because that's kind of the COVID time. Yeah, we have. I mean, it's been a little curious with COVID, but we 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 have. And uh, Sir Simmons runs those. Um, and we have gotten a financial literacy grant every year since they've been available. So that's Fund Code 104. And so for two years in a row, uh, Sir put on with some other uh, faculty a career. Uh, fair, a personal literacy fair one year. So um, we have done that. It's been kind of a mix of yeah. career, we did a straight career fair. And this um, this included some financial literacy and, and uh, other components. This year we're using that funding for, we did receive that grant again. Sir, uh, Sir Simmons will be writing an advanced personal finance course, that course that the school committee agreed to one, approve the course and then make it a graduation requirement, which I do believe you guys, that I do believe you were first in Massachusetts to do that. Um, kids really, students really like that course. And so they want another one. So it's gonna write an advanced one for those who wanna stay with this, but we do. And, um, and I'll look into, you're reminding me of how enjoyable that was for students. So looking into, um, maybe we can have both like, uh, personal literacy and a um, career fair like fall and spring. Yeah, I just know it was nice. It was yeah. neat to bring people in from the community. Yeah. And I think mm -hmm. all of us have pretty diverse backgrounds that we know people and, um, and a lot of our parents too, a lot of our school community have pretty diverse backgrounds. So it might be just interesting to hear 
you know, I, I know I, I found it interesting that that one time they did it that I forget, I think Brian had given a feedback on it at a um at a one of our school committee meetings. And it's just interesting to hear how much diversity just amongst the school community parents really have and what they do and opportunities out there. And so it would just be neat to do that and involve the community and have that in person. And so I, I like that if we can keep doing that. That's great. Great reminder, Tara. I know one year the school council did it at Hopkins. So um, I, I don't know if that's not, if that's a possibility. Yeah. yeah. All right. Terrific. Thank you, Annie, for that. Oh, and, uh, Ethan. Yes. I, I just wanted to ask, Annie, is this something that you, I, I mean, Christine, you kind of got at this a little bit, but is this something that with point six and it being a one-year thing that you're thinking we could continue to do? I it's kind of just kind of like a trial run or yeah, well I imagine the state this is remains a priority for the state the new governor we we've seen in previous budgets that uh Baker's budgets previously early college and innovation pathways high quality college and career pathways were 100 percent that administration's priority and it was supported by the legislature and you could see that in the budget setting now when we see what's being talked about right now for uh, high quality college and career pathways for coming years, I believe this is going to remain a priority. It certainly um, appears to be a shared priority. The new governor is very interested in these pathways. So I think there will be funding um, that if it works well, that we could continue it and we may not uh, need to use the operating budget for that for a time. That's great news. Terrific. All right. Thank you, Annie. We're going to move on to the student representative report. No, 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 no. Yeah. I guess I'm going to preview. This will be like a trailer when they show up next month and you guys can just say, yay, we saw the preview and we know how great you are. They are great. Uh, one, Grant was planning on being here tonight, but he is uh, giving remarks for one of his peers who are being recognized in the swim team senior night. So the grant is busy tonight, he's in high demand. I wanna point out that Grant was featured in my superintendent's newsletter. Grant participated with some uh, representatives from CES on a student panel uh, that we went to. I wrote about, I can't now remember the name of the conference that we were at. It was a wonderful conference. Grant was one of the students that was up there and he was the one who um, asked a question that one of the speakers commented that it was one of the best questions she had ever heard. And I on the I was Grant's ride on the way home. I said, wow, nobody ever says that about me. And I'm like paid to run the place. <laughs> and so he will be one of your school committee reps. And Priscilla Cruz, delightful, intelligent, witty, and wonderful 10th grader at Hopkins Academy. And I imagine, just is on me, that Priscilla, since it was a snow day, assumed that it's a snow day, which is a good assumption. So we will see both of them next month. Very good, thank you. All right, Chris, we are gonna invite you back for the business manager reports. Okay, um, this month I have three reports for you. The first one is just the regular budget expense report that you get every month. Um, there was a little bit of work done this past uh, week really just to start transferring expenses to grants where they should be we were awarded the grants so now we can actually start moving expenses to them um, so that cleaned it up a little bit i actually did some more transfers this afternoon after this report was run, so it actually looks a little bit better than what you see here um, but it's always better to look better than worse so um, as you can see if you look at the end of the report we're about three and a half million dollars uh, remaining in the budget for the year um, that's, as you can see, look at it, the, the budget is about seven and a half million. So we're a little more than halfway through the budget. Um, and that pretty much puts us right in line. There are some opportunities still to transfer more expenses to grants and also to school choice, circuit breaker. Um, those will be done as need arises and as we move through the school year. Um, there are some accounts that are over budget some that are under budget as, as is typical with um, every school year. Sometimes it's, it's really just a question of, uh, I'm thinking of something like sped tuition where we budgeted 
students to be in a collaborative program and then they moved to just a, a more uh, traditional non-public school setting and so therefore one is over one is under and they you know pretty much even themselves out at the end um, i don't know if anybody has any questions on this no questions for me no i don't think so okay. um the next report i have is the revolving account report um <clears throat> the only item that i don't have is the student activity account balance um d was not in so i was unable to get that from her I'll, I'll make sure we have them for the next report, all three months at that point in time. Um, but the rest of the accounts, with the exception of lunch, really kind of hover around the same balances. Um, the lunch account, we're missing the December deposits. So that should bring us you know, much closer to where we were at the end of November. Um, school choice increased again, it's been increasing. I did a, a partial transfer of expenses today to school choice. So that will be reflected in the January balance. But again, um, you know, nice healthy balances in all of our revolving accounts. It's certainly nice to see. Uh, I can answer any questions anyone might have for those as well. No questions for me. Nope. Okay, and the last report I have for you is the grants report. Um, so, you know, there are some grants that we have made uh, expense transfers to, others we have not yet. Um, some were just awarded, so we haven't even had an opportunity to, but um, as you can see, we've started spending our grant balances down. Still haven't touched the S or three, which is really nice because, um, you know, we're kind of holding back on that one. Uh, there are some heat system related um, expenses that we budgeted for out of there uh, and some salary items as well that we've yet to uh, have to charge to it. So. We have another couple of years really before that grant runs out and it's uh, it'll be nice to, to have that carry through some of the expenses we'll be seeing down the road. Um, Can I speak again, to that also, Chris, just to reinforce what you said, please remember for the public too, that when you look at our capital plan, you can sort by funding source and by fiscal year when the work is planned. And so you'll see there are several places where it says grant funding. So we do know that we will be spending, particularly with HVAC and some of these energy upgrades we hope to do. Um, so that's one of the priorities of ESSER. That's where we're hoping to spend that money. Right, and we only have two years left for that. Is that true? In order to be able right. to spend that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, the nice thing about these energy improvements we're making is that they achieve two things. I mean, number one, they, they bring it into a little more modern uh, system than what is currently in the building. We certainly expect energy savings, so we'll get some payback monetarily from that. But the other side is that it's just going to be a more comfortable building for the students and staff to be in. So it's, it's really a slam dunk with that because we save money and everybody's happier because they're more comfortable in the building. So um, that's why we focused a good portion of that ESSER 3 grant to the HVAC area, just because you know it, it works well for all. Um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions about the grants at all. Any questions for Chris? Okay. Well, you guys gave me an easy night. Thanks. Easy night. All right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. We are going to move next to school committee reports and discussion. Um, no finance meeting uh, yet, so nothing to report there. Uh, CES, Tara. Um, so we have our January meeting this coming Wednesday, so I will send out information by the end of the week, um, the director's report and anything really um, notable. And then if there's any questions, you can ask me next month or shoot me an email. Awesome. Thank you, Tara. And policy, Ethan. Uh, yeah, so Christine and I did a first read tonight of the library materials policy, um, and I believe we'll do second reading, or will we bring it, Annie, to the, the team next month? Is that the plan? Yes, we're there. For yep. yep. Terrific. Perfect. Paul's not here for a fields update, and I'm wondering, uh, either Chris or Annie, is there anything to report there? There is. Um, I did speak with Carlos at Berkshire Design a couple of weeks ago. He said that the next step is just to get um, Conservation Commission approval 
that's why actually I was a little bit curious as to seeing them at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, I'm like, oh, I, I guess they're coming to tell us something and I just didn't know it, but uh, sadly, no. Um, but we did receive, I, I got this afternoon, something from the state. Um, yeah, it's a DEP file number. It says, please uh, find attach the file number for the proposed work. If you have any questions, please contact me. So um, I guess my question would be <laughs> to him, I'm not really sure why I'm getting this, you know, without any, I, I don't know what it's for. Um, but I have to assume that that meant that something was approved. And um, I noticed that Carlos was not included on it. So I'm going to forward that to Carlos and just ask him to please explain it to me. The Conservation Commission got it as well, though. So um, I'm sure they know what it's for. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let you guys know as soon as I find out. Great. I guess it's, it's a good thing because it's progress. So that's, that's the nice thing. We'll take it as a sign. Yes. Okay. Terrific. Um, and Capital, Christine. Uh, nothing so far. All right. Terrific. Thank you. We're moving on to announcements, and we'd love to welcome Joyce. Joyce, are you there? You can unmute. Yes. Hi. How are you? Great. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me this evening. I always enjoy coming and seeing what's going on, and it certainly has been a, a very informative meeting. Um, and your words of um, town partnership has, uh, it's wonderful. Um, I, I have to go back a little bit and say that uh, when I first started this politic business, um, the schools in the town were on opposite pages and you know the word on the street back in those days was is that the school took all the money um which you know because it was the biggest budget well i don't think it's the biggest budget anymore um i think you know um we've come around uh, you know done a 360 on um, our partnership and i think it's done very well with the town and how everybody appreciates um and your leadership um, school committee, how we can all work together and uh, strive for. And I said it back 36, almost 36 years ago that, you know, we're here for our children because they are our future. They're the ones that are going to be taking care of me. I mean, I'm getting old now, but it's going to be even more. And, um, you know, they're going to be taking care of you and everybody else in town. And hopefully they'll come back and you know, pick up some pieces and carry on where you all and I am. And, you know, so it's a good thing. So that being said, I just wanted to just chime in for a minute that the things that you mentioned tonight on the uh, student population and where our students are and the school choice and whatever, people are always asking those questions. So, you know, I'm going to mention that at my meeting is that they can go on your website and see those uh, graphs and see where our kids are and uh, how nice it is that actually the kids are staying in town and not outsourcing. Yet we do have that ability, which we've always said right along, is that kids need that opportunity to have a different avenue of education. And, you know, have, going to vocational or whatever has certainly, um, the idea of bridging between academic and vocational, I think is great. And I think that's also changed um, over the years on how people perceive that also. So I appreciate that also. That was a good um, thing to bring up. Um, on your fields, uh, just have Chris contact Conservation Commission. Somebody should be there tomorrow. Um, and we had an update. We did have a meeting. I didn't, I wasn't involved with it because we did, couldn't have a quorum, uh, but there was a meeting on the Hawk uh, Light out in, on Route 9. Uh, and that was with uh, Dan Carey and Elena, uh, the administrative assistant for jo uh, Senator Comerford. Um, so they were there with um, uh, Chief Mason and Chief Spank and Abel, Carolyn Brennan, uh, Randy and Jane from uh, town. Uh, certainly they're not moving it, so we have to deal with it, but we're going to try and make it better. There were other suggestions on what we could do uh, in lowering uh, the flashing lights so that they're not up high and that people will be more aware of it. So 
it's still a work in progress. So that still, it's not gone away and we're still trying to very much try to correct that situation. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. All right, Joyce. Um, we're moving on to school committee member updates. Um, does anyone have any updates for the public? Okay, I'll mention um, that uh, the little parent organization grassroots initiative called Hadley Learns, which um, is really a, an initiative to learn about uh, uh, all matter of issues related to uh, diversity and equity and inclusion. Um, that organization, uh, loose, loose group of people has been going since June, 2020 um, with monthly programming and is uh, taking a pause to uh, do a survey and um, planning a whole bunch of other activities for the year. But if you've ever attended, uh, please contact me so I can give you a survey. If you've never attended, but always wanted to, or perhaps want to slightly different programming, um, uh, programming for other members of your family, whatever, we're very open-minded. So please email me. You can reach me at humera at humera.com. That's easy to remember. Feel free to just um, drop me a line and I'm happy to share with you the link. And I think that's a wrap. Um, I believe so. Oh, no. We're going to congratulate. This is this, this is this So yes, Humera, thank you for texting and letting I had no idea. And I will uh, just read very quickly from Mass DOT to Mr. Driver. Good morning, Mr. Driver. This email is to let you know that a snowplow name associated with this email has been chosen as a winner of the 2022-23 Name a Snowplow Contest. So Mr. Driver's fifth grade class at Hadley Elementary School in Hadley will be assigned uh, the snowplow in, in Highway District 2 and because they named it, and that doesn't mean uh, children at Hadley Elementary School, you will not be driving it or uh, working <laughs> as flowers right now in fifth grade. But the name is Snow Day, No Way, which I would say that my actions over the last two days have kind of belied that. But it's a great name and they won. And that's so awesome. So GOT will be coming out to do photos and they have one of 12 snowplows that are named in the Commonwealth. So well done, 5D. Wow. That is a wonderful achievement. Congratulations to the class and Mr. Driver. That's pretty amazing. Can't wait to see I, that. I just want to say that all I'm just looking at all the names. They're all incredible. They're hilarious. The names, they are so good. <laughs> They're really good. All right. Excellent. Uh, moving on to this next item here, upcoming events, HPS calendar. Yes, so this Friday, it's the end of the uh, quarter. So for both schools, there is early dismissal. I do want parents to know and the community to know that early dismissal or uh, late start a half day or we have a delayed start, those count toward the 180 days. When I cancel school entirely, which my apologies, this is not, it's really hard to call snow. And I know that, um, Friday, we had concerns about the timing and that temperatures were hovering close to freezing. And all it takes when I talk to DPW at uh, Lucky Scott between 4 and 4.30 in the morning when I call him, um, we just wonder sometimes if the temperature changes like that. Um, it's just our weather this winter has just been miserable in terms of everything hovering around the freezing line. Um, but it is looking very good for tomorrow so we can all be back in school. And again, the only days that, that we have to make up are when school is canceled entirely. Um, so, and besides an already scheduled half day, there's nothing except for February break, which will come up in about three weeks, four weeks, about four weeks. Great. Um, and there is a an early dismissal day this Friday, I see. Yes. Yes, right. that was a regularly scheduled end of the quarter, half day. So teachers complete grades in the second half of the day or enter them. Very important, very important. Thank you very much. I, I just want to make a comment about 
the snow days because I, I Annie, I think you're doing a great job. It is not easy. And uh, I think to err on the side of caution is always better, particularly when you have high schoolers who are driving and, and it may be their first time driving in the snow. So I, I don't let anybody, you know, tell you otherwise you're doing a great job. Thank you. And I just want to say, I do empathize with parents. I do just the superintendent say, you know, we text each other and just on the text thread right before school committee, they got a lot of snow up in the hill towns. And so some of them said, are people delaying tomorrow? And I said, I think I might have to get a job selling hot dogs off a cart if I don't get to school tomorrow. So we are going to school tomorrow. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, it is, I mean, I cannot imagine um, for 430. I think I would be like half sleeping the whole night for fear of of, uh, of not being able to get up and making that call. So uh, that's that's got to be hard. Um, and thank you for making that call. Okay, we're moving on to action items. Approval of the minutes for December 20th, 2022. Do I hear a motion? I make a motion. All right. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, we have uh, Aye. Four, four in favor and, and one uh, absent. Um, approval of the warrants, December 2022. Do I hear a motion? I make so a motion. Oh, seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 And approval of workforce development and internship coordinator. I don't think we did this when you presented it, uh, Annie. So uh, do I hear a motion? So moved. And Aye. Second. Aye. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. And then finally, the approval of the November 28th, 2022 policy subcommittee meeting minutes. That's just Ben and Chris. Ah, so, so moved. So moved. Seconded. Yeah, second. We're both in favor. We're, right. we're definitely in favor. Yes. Yes. Excellent. All right. So the next meeting date is February 27th. And we will have a policy meeting that meets at 430. And a regular the school committee meeting will begin at 530 p.m. We are not going into executive session. So do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. I think we don't have to do an all in favor, but let's do it for posterity. All in favor? Aye. 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 Excellent. Thank you, everyone. So nice to see you. Have a great Thank evening, guys. Have a good night. Good night.